I recently completed my first solo honor mode run with a tavern brawler halfling throw zerker. And in this video, I'll go over early Act 1 pathing and highlights. It involves mostly collecting easy XP and the key items for the build. I'll explain my choices, probably in too much detail. Level 1 is on the Nautiloid. I loot way more than I need to. I extract us and don't injure it because I like to have them in late Act 2 and 3. On this run, I use Us, Scratch, and Temporary Companions when they're available. I still call it a solo run, because I'm just using one of the four available party member slots. Lazel joins us, and we do the first fight. I'm a bit weak early on, because I've dumped my strength down to 8. So I have to remember to use finesse, dex based weapons early on. Us carries us through this fight because I'm still using a strength based weapon. I rectify this after the fight, put on a scimitar and steal Lazel's armor. Kill these two for 20 experience. This ship is crashing. Do you intend to die for a stranger? Save Shadowheart for 5 experience. For the Commander Zulk fight, I try to kill 4 imps and 2 hellbores for their XP and then leave. It is possible to kill the demons or mind flayer, but it takes too long and I fail more and have to reset. I tried to do this fight only attacking with us and my character, but ended up cheating rather than rerunning the Nautiloid. So what are my rules for this run? These are just arbitrary restrictions I set myself for this run, and it's not going to be the same as what I play every time. Please play what you find fun. Over my rules for this run, might give you some ideas of things you want to try. I'm calling it solo, as in just one party member, out of the possible four. In terms of companion usage, after the Nautiloid, I never use them in combat for buffs or to pass any checks. No respecs, and that means no money for withers. On previous runs, I was respecking a lot, and that made the character have a little bit less identity when it's just melding into different things as required. I'm not going to use any barrelmancy, collecting barrels, bombs or fireworks, stacking them up and detonating them. I'm still going to throw smoke powder bombs, and if somebody fell asleep by a barrel, that's really not my fault. That's a bit about letting my character's abilities shine and not be overshadowed by very powerful explosives. I will, however, be making heavy use of consumables including the giant elixirs, which I'll be drinking almost the whole game, special arrows and scrolls, summons from scrolls. I'll be using temporary companions where they're available. That'll mean us on the Nautiloid and Glut in the Underdark. Some of these do put a bit of dent into my class identity because I'm a berserker, but I'm still going to be able to cast spells as needed. I might do a run without them in future, but at this stage, I'm definitely not good enough to cut out the consumables. This is the only time I use any party member in combat. I don't use them to fight, cast buffs, or to pass skill checks for the rest of the run. I steal Lazel and Shadowheart's gear, and then hit the beach. The helm's alien as you wake. The tadpole squirms in your skull. Something the Level 2 starts here on the beach. We sure, recruit Shadowheart for 30 XP and send her to camp. That takes me to level 2. I dip weapon into the handy fire here. You can also dip into a candle once you get one. 
This is great if you don't have a good use for your bonus action early on. Dip doesn't work with throwing weapons though, and we're going to have Enraged Throw from level 3, so we won't make a habit of it. They seem to prefer using their melee attack to their ranged attack, uh, but I think their ranged attack is more powerful, so I always close the gap on them if possible, so they can get in and melee me. The plan early on is to get Hill Giant Elixirs, the Returning Pike, and then the Tavern Brawl of Feet at level 4. With only those three key things, this build is very strong early. Recruit a Starion for 30 XP. The main goal on most solo runs early on should be easy XP, stuff you can get without fighting or risky checks. Kill the Injured Mind Flayer for 35 XP. Equip the Rapier and Shield because I'm still running around with 8 Strength. Do the Grovegate fight. Doesn't matter how well you play, really, as you get all the Goblin XP, and I don't think it affects my XP if Aradurn or his crew lives. So the stakes are pretty low. Zevlor and Will only very rarely can die. We loot the goblins and get our first magic item, some gloves. Be careful looting here, especially if any of your allies died. Looting them can anger the tieflings. Before heading into the grove, I get the Guidance Amulet from Spider Hill. Equip it and cast Guidance to yoink the spider bag. If you fail the checks here, you'll miss out on 5 XP and a fantastic consumable item that spawns spiders to distract the enemies. I always try to grab this item, carry it around for the entire game, and never remember to use it. Head into the grove with the Guidance Amulet. Punch Aradin, why not? Talk to Zevlor for some XP. Find me. If you need an item from Zevlor or Aradin for some reason, you can punch them and pockpick at them safely while they're knocked out. Convince Roland to stay with the Barbarian option for 15 XP. If you don't have an automatic success option, you might want to get some inspiration points before attempting to convince them. Because if they don't stay to help, uh, you lose some tieflings on the way to Act 2. Recruit Will and send him to camp? Although he doesn't give any XP. Talk to Auntie Ethel. Let her fuss over you to take the free healing potion. And then I'm going to raise her attitude to 100. Because I plan on buying a few elixirs from her and selling junk to her. I should have given her all my gold before any items here, it's more efficient that way. I then buy three Hill Giant Strength Elixirs. She gets three more every time you long rest. I only expect to have to buy them off her three or four times, and that should set me up for Act 1 and 2. Before leaving the Grove, I want to raise Damon's reputation as much as possible, so I'll give him any gold and then items that I find. I'll be buying the hunting shortbow from him when I can, and I plan to keep him alive until Act 3. We head into the grove, talk to Kaga, and can let Arabella go. Loot Kaga's chest and read the Shadow Druid message in there. Talk to Nettie and tell you have a parasite and that you'll find Halson. Talk to Alfira, some XP if you pass the performance checks. Get tough at the bear off the elevator for 20 XP. Talk to Edwin and send his friends to the Albert. Recruit Scratch. Then I do my first long rest and drink a Hill Giant Elixir. I head to the Blighted Village, and if I pass the Perception check walking into the entrance, I notice the ambush. I'll choose Intimidate option, because I think I could win the fight if it fails. If you think you could die here, you can use the Elithid Wisdom option. I then head into the town. Kill the solo goblin near the well. Loot the helm of haste from the chest in the middle of Blighted Village. 
and then head to the Blighted Village Windmill and use the Illithid Wisdom option for 190 XP. You can free Barkus and get his smoke powder satchel from the basement as well. I then head north of the Blighted Village over the bridge, do firefighting at Joachim's Rest and get the waypoint there. I head along the river. There's a ring on a skeleton that helps with sleight of hand. Then we head to Karlak and recruit her and send her to camp. She gives no XP as well. Head back to the grove and buy three more hill giant elixirs. We should be level three by now, so I'm comfortable doing really oh, easy you, fights. We clear the tunnel and save Findle. And then we free Saza for 30 XP and lead her through the tunnel. Head to Blighted Village Waypoint and then to the Goblin Camp. And Saza will get you into the camp without a fight. Unlike the Drow option, you don't get XP for defeating them. So I'll come back later and kill them. Have some spooky visions. Head into the Goblin Camp. We'll talk to Volo so he gets locked up inside and you get 15 XP. Talk to the Blue Pants Goblin. If you can convince him to give you the Dwarven Poem, read it for some XP. I failed and didn't buy it from him. I don't think it's worth it. Talk to Crusher and kiss his feet to steal his ring. Gives you a movement speed ring, which is especially good for my halfling to offset their lower movement speed. If you fail to steal his ring, you'll anger him and get into a fight. Uh, if you do that, focus on him. When he gets low, he'll grovel and the other goblins will stop fighting as well. I head to the side entrance into the Shattered Sanctum, the indoor goblin area. As a halfling, I wanted to try out this entrance. I start attacking Liam's Torturous, feeling overconfident as a berserker with 21 strength. I don't have Tavern Brawl of Feet or the Returning Pike, so I'm mostly throwing Javelins. In honor mode, it's a good idea to consider your escape plan. So that's one thing I did do right. I knew I could get out that side entrance if anything went wrong. Consider things like, where are you going to run? Can you get through a door or get far enough away to leave combat? Do you have an invisibility potion, fly potion or darkness arrow or some other consumable that's going to help you escape? I try to do some cleanup of the bodies, but make a huge mistake here. I aggro Zerga the goblin boss, and I've used up my action while they were spotting me. This means they're easily able to get to and use the war drum. I could have avoided this either by cleaning up the bodies quicker, destroying the war drum first, or aggroing Zerga further away from the drum. I run out of the camp immediately as I'm not ready to face the main room. There are a lot of negative implications of this mistake, letting the war drum go off. It makes all the goblins indoor permanently hostile. That means they're all red instead of yellow, so it's harder to get opening moves on them. And I've missed out on the Bran from Priestess Gut and the Leviata Blessing from Abderak, which is a decent permanent buff. I should have done both of these before attacking anyone. Roa Moonglow, the Zentrum Vendor, also leaves when you aggro the whole camp, but I wasn't after any of their items. I head back in and finally free Liam. And then Volo. <laughs> I 
Next, I continued down the right side of the camp and attacked the goblin sharp eyes near the prison. This was another questionable move, and I dipped pretty low and definitely could have died here. Here's an example throwing opener. I'm in real-time mode and enter stealth, then throw a weapon, then enter turn-based mode while it's in flight. This lets me keep my action, unlike if you throw while in turn-based mode. In this case, I pass a stealth check and don't enter combat, so I'm able to throw again. I didn't realize I still wasn't in combat and stepped forward into combat with the third sharp eye. A better move would be to back away, leave turn based, and re engage. The third sharp eye summons a warg, and I could have gone into frenzy on turn one, but I tried getting through the fight without using it. Usually, when I try to save resources, I end up getting in danger and using more resources. Use what you've got. Do that long rest, use that scroll, drink that bigger potion. My usual plans are in disarray here, as I've skipped, failed or messed up a lot of the easy XP. I was planning to use the brand to make talking to the ogres in the blighted village safe. Making a deal with them rewards 225 experience. I head back to the outdoor goblin camp and finish off some things I should have done earlier. Now that I have an animal speaking potion, I do the chicken chasing, the 35 XP and 300 gold. We tell the chicken to run through the posts. Well, looky here. Part as the symbol glows, power courses through you. Authority. To get your Wittings, I use the Barbarian Intimidate option here. You can also use a Lithid Wisdom or be a Drow. Nicked him off the dead, didn't I? I finally buy the Returning Pike from Grat the Trader. I try to pay with gold because I'm not planning to raise his attitude or buy any other items from him. While I'm here, I push Crusher off the bridge. Why not? At this point we have two out of three of the key components of the build, and we're decently strong, but it's not till we get Tavern Brawler at level four going. that the build is fully online. Then I go clear out Wither's script, then with my returning pike I head back inside the Shattered Sanctum and take on Priestess Gut in the middle room from the high ground. I then head through Priestess Gut's room, sneaking past her ogre bodyguard Palma and into the Underdark. In the Underdark we grab the Luminous Armor in the Cellunite Outpost. Then using Featherfall we jump to Felur Aluv and then the Myconid Colony. We save Balin and grab the Noble Stalk. Dereth gives us Gloves of Uninhibited Kashigo which add 1 to 4 throwing damage. Then we raise the attitude of Dereth and Blurg at the Myconid Colony to 100%. This costs 600 gold because we're level 3. I do this because I plan to buy consumables and alchemy reagents from these two vendors for most of the game. I tell Blurg about our tadpole situation and take Omelum's mushroom quest, give Thula an antidote, Glut wants to join us to kill Duergo. Volo performs some surgery on us with absolutely no drawbacks. Oh bother! Sure, terribly sorry, my friend. Ta. We head over to fight the Hook Horrors. Sometimes I pass a stealth check like this and don't enter combat. It's sometimes good, but sometimes annoying. While out of combat, trying to engage an enemy, I throw javelins and hand axes from the inventory instead of the returning pike because I find it doesn't return reliably when thrown out of combat. Glut can cast spells from scrolls in your bags. You select him and then press tab and then right click on scrolls. 
he's pretty ineffective in this fight here because of his sunlight sensitivity. Enraged Throw does some good work in this fight. I have advantage from the Hunting Shortbow, but some unlucky misses here could have been really bad. After killing the first Hook Horror, Glut can resurrect him, and we're a lot safer fighting the second, as it's a 3 on 1 situation. The Returning Pike. Why is it such a big deal? It does 1 to 10 plus 1 as its base damage. No other weapon in Act 1 comes close. Uh, axes do 1 to 6, spears and javelins do 1 to 6. Even for an Eldritch Knight who can make any thrown weapon return, that doesn't make them good. Any item that doesn't have the thrown tag on it will not deal proper base damage. You can find other magic items that do have the thrown tag on them, but in Act 1 most of them are plus 1. Most text written on the weapons will not work. It will usually only trigger if you make an attack with the weapon. Weapons that give passive buffs mostly don't seem to work if you throw them and they leave your hands, although you can benefit from holding a weapon that gives a buff, throwing a different weapon. The only two weapons that come close are the Lightning Jabbers, which add a bit of lighting damage, and the spear you get from resolving the Night Song situation, which is 1d6 plus 3 weapon. We're finally level 4, and take the Tavern Brawler feat. This is a large damage buff, and as a halfling we almost completely stop missing thrown attacks. Even when attacking with disadvantage, like at point blank range, we still almost entirely stop missing. We take the high ground and dispatch Philro and the remaining hook horrors. I would recommend this build for anyone trying out a solo run, or if you just want a powerful party member in honor mode. The returning pike says it returns. It returns a lot of the time. There's a few things you can do to make it return more. One is to not end your turn immediately after you throw it. Allow it to return to your hands. Another is to not throw it out of combat. I find if it initiates combat, it often stays on the ground and doesn't return to your hands. The returning pike is also heavy. So it's in the weight category where it does more crushing damage than most other throwing weapons. This is notable attacking from high ground where you'll see an extra crushing damage number with each of your attacks. If you're mostly using a returning pike, you don't have to carry as many other weapons around or pick them up off the ground during the fight. So if you're carrying around a few weapons that do 1d6 plus 1, the returning pike's doing 2 damage more on average than those. The downside is, you could be using a shield and throwing weapons from your inventory. So the trade-off is basically damage and convenience versus armor class. After the fight, we recover all the thrown weapons and grab the Susa Bark. Then I head over and fight the Spectator. This was reckless. I would recommend doing this fight at level 5 minimum, as the Spectator can do a lot of damage and also paralyze. Ignoring my earlier advice, I throw the returning pike out of combat here, but fortunately it returns. I used Glut to cast Protection from Evil on my character, but I could have easily died or Glut could have been killed. I carted the Spectator into the outpost so I could mostly ignore the Drow, and then mopped up the remainder after the Spectator was dead. I smashed some Petrified Drow before the fight. You can break out the Spectator controlled Drow by damaging them, but I find they die quickly and trying to break them out puts me in a bad position.
there is a safer way of doing the spectator where you attack from the Selenite outpost window where I started the fight and then back off. Doing this you can stay out of combat uh, and he just wanders back and forth. I generally prefer when the enemies fight back or at least are trying to reach me uh, which probably means I'm not well suited to the stealthy lifestyle. Every turn spectator can use an unpetrification ray to break out a drow on his side, fly, bite, and do two rays, selecting between fear, paralyze, or poison damage. If he lands paralyze, that can be the end of your run. I've lost a previous honor mode run here. Getting Ring of Free Action, which gives immunity to Paralyze from Arage in Act 2, uh, and having Poison Resistance both make this fight safer. Maybe I hoped the Spectator would put me out of my misery, but we get through the fight. This Honor Mode run doesn't feel like it's going smoothly. I've missed out on the Brand and the Leviathan buff, uh, modified my pathing a lot and didn't get to level 4 as quick as I normally do. It can be fun to perfect your run, but I also enjoy rolling with the punches, and I think the things that go wrong make the runs more unique. Part 1 finishes on a boss kill, and there will be more stuff ups and disasters in part 2. But something tells me that ultimately we'll make it through to the end. And that's that I finished it a while ago.